that. Uh, this will probably be the last time. Uh, because we had our HABS forecast today, um, the research lecture becomes me, and your guest lecture becomes Dr. Rick Stump from NOAA. Um, so I'm going to go through, as you're seeing here with this talk, talk about um, Lake Erie algae, nutrient loading, and then current research efforts. So this is kind of the goal for the talk I have for you today. Um, but as, as I ask all the other folks that come up here, I, I ask them to kind of tell you how they got to where they are now, not just jump right into the science. So I will do the same for you and kind of give you a, a little glimpse into the trajectory that I took to get here, which uh, was not necessarily very straight. Uh, so, uh, undergrad at Ohio University down in Athens, and I knew I wanted it to be in environmental science, but I had no darn clue what the heck I wanted to do post-graduation. And so, I got into that like third year, third and a half year, and wondered what the heck I was going to do with my life. And so, I found out about uh, AmeriCorps, which is the in-state version of Peace Corps. And so, there was a position out in Montana, and being a you know junior in college, actually just starting a senior year, I thought, yeah, it'd be kind of cool to live in Montana for a year. So I did um, that. Uh, so that was kind of where I needed some space to get away from school and kind of rethink what I wanted to do. Um, when I was a junior, though, I actually had an internship with the Ohio EPA. And as some of the speakers have told you this summer up here, getting those uh, research experience like our REU students are getting or getting an internship, sometimes that does a good job of solidifying what you want to do with your career. So with my internship with the Ohio EPA, shocking fish all day long on Lake Erie, and a year that I spent out in Montana, I realized that I wanted to work for um, the Ohio EPA. So I thought I wanted to be a fisheries biologist with the Ohio EPA. Uh, you get into that, that space, though, where you realize what you think you want to do with your career, and now you realize the degree you have isn't enough. And so I knew I had to go back for a master's degree. Um, I was never in undergrad thinking graduate school was for me. I found the job that I thought I wanted, and that kind of forced me into graduate school. So I went on to get my master's, or started my master's at Bowling Green State University, working on, on fish-related stuff, um, largemouth bass specifically, um, and growth rates and how they exist over a, such a large latitudinal gradient. And doing the graduate work to get that end goal of working for the EPA, I found out that I liked to teach it because as a grad student, they stick you in a classroom and they say, okay, you're a TA for this entry-level biology course. And so I fell in love with teaching, and then my mindset of going to work for the EPA was like, no, now I need to teach, and a master's isn't going to get me there either. And so then it opened up that PhD window. And so then I got into the PhD program, and my PhD work happened here. And so I spent two summers, uh, 2004, 2005, studying smallmouth bass and round goby and invasive fish in the lake and how they interact. And so I was then in that PhD track. I was going to finish my PhD and get a tenure track professor job somewhere. But I came here and got exposed to the importance of a Sea Grant and an outreach program. That idea of you're not just doing your research in a vacuum, you're also teaching county commissioners that come up to the island, or you're teaching farmers that come up to the island the importance of your work. So I, I kind of got that bug of this idea of not just doing research and publishing papers, but to do some of this outreach and engagement of, the, of stakeholders. But I finished my PhD and I did all that work and got a tenure track job out in Pennsylvania at a, at a university called Kutztown near, uh, uh, between Reading and Allentown. And I started teaching out there and I was uh, in about my year and a half, two years, and the director, uh, the previous director, Jeff Reuter, uh, had just lost his assistant director to another program. And so he asked me to put in an application. And the rest is basically history. I came in as an assistant director and then was promoted to associate director. And then when that director retired, I stepped in as a full director. So me being here all came from me being an undergrad, just knew I wanted to be outside, maybe doing some fish stuff, but had no freaking clue. The master's happened because it was the next door I had to go through to get to what I thought was the next career job, and the PhD was the next door I had to go through to get to the next career job, and then that's kind of how I ended up, ended up here. Um, and so I, I bring that story just because there are some, some research talks that come here and guest lectures that talk here that say they knew since seventh grade what they wanted to do, and they went in this straight line but it's not necessarily always, always that way. All right, so let's get into this. Um, not a lot of data-heavy stuff here, but this is the kind of talk that because of the work that we do here with Justin's work, a lot of the professors that are teaching here, and the grants that we get to manage as a C grant program, I get exposed to a lot of this research. And so I take it upon myself, and it's part of my job, is to help the researcher that does this work get it into the hands of people that can use it. So a lot of this isn't going to be my data or my work, but it's, it's stuff that I try and get out into the general. 
some of the, those of you that are taking some of the like Darren's Lindo course and others, um, you know, with Doug, you'll hear a lot about HABs, and this is going to be very, of course, HABs focused. So the first thing I do when I sit with anybody, I talk about this slide. This is the economic impact of tourism uh, for the Great Lakes counties. So what you're seeing, of course, in this map, thank you, um, James, these are the 88 counties, the shades of blue in Ohio. The ones that are bordered in red, there are eight of them there. These are the eight of 88 counties that directly touch Lake Erie. These numbers are only for those um, eight, or eight counties, so those tiny little, tiny county sets that's in the red. So this is the sales generated by tourism. It's around $14 billion. To put that number into perspective, the entire state has about $40 billion tourism revenue. So upwards of 30-ish percent of the entire tourism revenue comes from only eight of 88 counties. If you look at this, this is wages. So this is the amount of money that folks that work in that sector earn by having jobs in the tourism sector. This is the taxes generated by that. This is local, state, and federal taxes, so $1.8 billion. And then this is the number of people employed in the tourism sector in those eight counties, so roughly 124,000 people. To put that in perspective, one in every 12 individuals that lives in one of those counties has a job related to tourism. So I use this to illustrate the importance of having a half free lake because it's important for tourism. But I'd be remiss if I stopped there and said that's the only reason we can care. Right? We like to recreate on the lake. That's why we need to clean it up. So I'm going to put a text box up here in just a second. I will admittedly tell you that it's not an exhaustive list, but it's to get you thinking about why this lake is so critical um, to the state. So the first one is there are other economic factors. So there's a cost to removing toxins from that drinking water. So when these halves grow and when they do produce toxins, those drinking water facilities that pull water from Lake Erie, clean it so that we can consume it, have to spend more money in that space. So the halves go away, that investment can decline. Uh, about 11 million people count on Lake Erie for drinking water. There's a cost to the communities to have drinking water advisories. So we know when the Toledo water crisis happened in 2014, that many of the businesses um, in Toledo for roughly uh, you know, 72 hours had to go without that water. And so you had hotels and restaurants closed. We know the charter captains rely on that for their livelihood, and so do marinas. We have seen some um, evidence that the charter captain reserve spots on those boats that's gone down during bad half years. And we've seen that there's boats slips in marinas that aren't sold during those bad half years. We now there's, know there's an impact on the fishery. These harmful algal blooms ultimately lose, move east. The central basin sink and decay. And in that process, they strip oxygen from the water. And we've seen um, the impact of those large, what we call dead zones on the, on the fishery. The last one I bring up here is because I, I talk to many different audiences, and, and nowadays a lot of it is that farming community because they've now been identified as one of the major sources for nutrients, and so I get to inter interact with them and engage them and talk about why they need to be interested in this issue. And the one thing we show is that these are great numbers for sales and jobs and wages, but Ohio is an agricultural state. Um, and so we know that as we're addressing these issues to clean this lake up, that we need to do what we're calling a win-win situation. One win would be a clean lake, but the second one would be as best we can to keep this agricultural um, industry within the Ohio, uh, where it's at now, or, or not at least decline precipitously. Excuse me, could you define for us again what HAVs stand for? Yeah, sorry. Harmful algal bloom. Right. Yep. Good. Um, so there are many algal species that grow in the lake. You've got the experts sitting around the room here today, but some of those, the cyanobacteria category in that, in that generic word algae, can produce toxins. That's what calls them harmful algae. There are nuisance algal species. Those are ones that just grow in excess but don't necessarily produce toxins. Um, why Lake Erie? What many people call me on a regular basis that don't understand the science behind this. They're saying, why just Lake Erie? Why not the other four Great Lakes? And so I put this image up here, and maybe you can help me. What is the biggest difference that jumps out of here from, from this image? Shallow, small, um, small lake. So you're seeing Superior, Ontario, Huron, and Michigan are overlapped here. We're not going to talk about whether that's one lake or two today. We'll leave it alone. Um, but Lake Erie is the shallowest. Um, it's the southernmost, so it's one of the warmer, warmer lakes. So that kind of sets the stage. These algae, as you've seen, or these cyanobacteria, as you've seen, need a certain temperature of water to, to uh, proliferate. The next thing is land use. Um, so what we have here is this percent land use on the vertical axis. The five lakes are on the x-axis here. I'll put a square around Erie to draw your attention there. But let's just plug through these different colors that are listed at the bottom. So as far as the watershed dedicated to urban um, coverage, Lake Erie is, is number one. It's first relative to the other four Great Lakes. 
As far as agriculture, Ontario is close, but it's clearly still first in ag. Both of these uses of the landscape are going to produce nutrients. You know, as we flush our toilets and, and, and we have runoff from our suburban areas, you're going to have a nutrient contribution in there. And then, of course, ag with the use of fertilizer, whether commercial fertilizer or, or manure. As far as grassland, it's pretty negligible across all the Great Lakes, so we'll skip over that. But as far as forested land, we have clearly the, the least. And it's oftentimes thought of your more pristine habitat, not typically thought of as one that contrib contributes nutrients. Wetlands, you'll see we are the least, but what more importantly I put up is always the number 10%. Because that reminds me, any audience that I have the opportunity to speak with, is that if you look at historic wetland coverage in the state of Ohio, we only have about 10% remaining. So we've cleared or drained or filled in about 90% of the soil. And those are often thought of as kind of the, the kidneys of, of aquatic systems, and they kind of draw down those nutrients that make it uh, make their way, among other things, but draw down some of those nutrients before they make it into receiving water. So this figure really should jump out with the, the nutrients associated with urban, with ag, little amount of quote unquote pristine habitat, and the loss of many kidneys. Why nutrients in this system can be uh, driving forward some of these ecologicals. If you actually go to like Lake, Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario, or Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, they're actually seeing lower nutrients than they like to see. The, the, the number of uh, algal growth in those lakes is down, which the zooplankton are down, and they're worried about the fisheries in those other large lakes. And what do you think in those other large lakes might be drawing those nutrients down? We have this organism here too, and it's not supposed to be here. changing the nutrient dynamics of those other lakes. Just to give you some uh, eye candy, you guys have seen some of this already, I'm sure, but this is uh, 2011, the second worst bloom on record. Here's a Canada geese, not a Canadian geese, right, James Marshall? Okay, Canada geese swimming through what looks like you know, pea soup or spilled paint. Uh, this is a colleague of, of many of ours, Dr. Richard Krauss with the USGS. This is his family out by Marblehead, so really near to the islands here. You talk to the charter captains, they'll even tell you in some instances when these scums get thick enough that their boats will bog down in the, in the viscous scum. This is 2013. I, I have the title here, Is This a Western Basin Problem? By the looks of this, you're seeing here's Pili and here's our Bass Islands, here's Catawba. This is what's considered the Western Basin. In this picture in 2013, which is not the worst bloom on record, half of the lake that you cannot see across when standing on the shoreline is covered by algae. Okay. Is it the Western Basin problem? My answer to that would be no. This is 2011, the second worst bloom on record, and you can see that it's moved out of the Western Basin and now is dotted along the shoreline. Here, for reference, that's Cleveland. So we're out east of Cleveland towards Pennsylvania and New York. Just a Lake Erie problem. So of course, I'm setting you up here. If you go to any search engine and put in Ohio and Habs, you're going to see things like that. Okay. So some of these you might be familiar with, Burr Oak State Park. Here's Buckeye Lake. Grand Lake St. Mary's is one of the first ones on the radar. You know, I always make the joke that it's never good to see McDonald's Shamrock Shakes sitting up on the beach. Um, here's Ohio River in 2015, which was the worst bloom on record for Lake Erie. Um, the, from basically Pittsburgh, you know, the headwaters of the Ohio River, all the way down to Cincinnati with one contiguous bloom. It's not like a bloom showed up somewhere and then kind of cruised its way down the river. That whole stretch um, was one contiguous. Um, so, what we have is a lot of money that's been put into this situation to address this issue. Um, we call it HABRI, which is the Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative. Um, if you were on the webinar today, I spoke about this. But when the money came in um, to help address this issue, it wasn't just nutrient reduction. Um, I'm going to show you kind of the four thematic areas that we tried to work in as we tried to address this issue. The first one is produce safe drinking water. Again, we're in a developed nation. It's scary for me to think that you can't turn on the tap in Toledo and not trust that there aren't fires. And different issue in places like Flint where they have lead, but for a country um, wealthy as we are, that, that is, uh, is a little alarm. So one of the first things that we had happen is a lot of this money poured into helping those water treatment plants uh, adopt tools, technology to remove those toxins um, with increased efficiency and de decreased cost. Along with that, we knew this was a toxin um, that had human health impacts. But not a lot was known here. There wasn't a lot of uh, literature out there about is it one large exposure that causes the ailments associated with this, or the liver toxin that can cause skin lesions, or is some neurotoxin evidence out there? Is it one dose that's the problem, or can you get small doses over long periods of time? Um, and so we needed to do a lot of work in this space to figure out 
um, the health impacts. There's been some work out now that we've helped fund and manage with the University of Toledo to look at is this a carcinogen. Um, we are seeing that some individuals that have pre-existing liver conditions, we are showing early growth of, of tumors in mice exposed to toxin concentration. Um, a lot of that work's happening. Even to the point where if you went to a beach that was green and you swam in that water and then felt sick the next day and went to the doctor, they couldn't tell whether it was microcystin exposure or not. Because when you ingest that toxin, your body's going to metabolize it into a different form. And we didn't know what we should be looking for in those instances. So now we have some technology that's coming out of the University of Toledo to be able to say we can take blood and plasma samples or urine samples and actually get an indication of you, if you've been exposed to or not. So there's a lot of work that was going on in this space, too. For the drinking water, some of the cool stuff, I can take a step back for this that I, I didn't mention. Um, cyanobacteria have been in the lake for millions of years, right? So that means they likely have their own set of viruses in the lake. Um, in this scenario, a virus for a bacteria, we refer to it as phages or phage. Um, so we have scientists that actually went out and find, find those viruses that attack the cyanobacteria and are bringing them into, bringing them into the water treatment plant. We use them to grade, either to grade the toxin, we have found some that will actually break the toxin down. We've also found some that will degrade the, the cyanobacteria themselves. We built new filters that make sure the water can go through, but it holds back the cyanobacteria. There are chemicals that we know we can add to remove the microsystems, but we really didn't know the dosages of those chemicals. And so a lot of research went in um, to figuring out some of those techniques. The next one is how uh, blooms behave. And a lot of the folks that are sitting in the room right now, Dr. Kane and Dr. Chaffin and, and Dr. Beatty, are looking at, at this. We had some experts on the, at the lab today come out of uh, Bowling Green and UT doing the same thing. So it's this idea of uh, what, what times of year are these things mixing? Um, why are they showing up this year in early June, earlier than they have before? You know, why do they die, die off when they die off? What are the genetics of the blooms, and what does that genetic dictate as far as their ability to produce toxins or not? And so a lot of work has gone into this um, now and, and likely will continue. So for example, today was a harmful algal bloom forecast that gives us an idea, and Rick played a role in that, is how big this bloom is likely going to be this summer, but right now we don't have the ability to tell how toxic that bloom is going to be. So size doesn't dictate toxicity, and so we have some folks with, again, Dr. Chaplin in the, in the room today that's trying to look at being able to predict that or model that in the future, too. And the last focus area was nutrient runoff. So, you know, these two were, when you think of it, kind of like an emergency room, this was kind of triage stuff. This had to be done first, the drinking water and the human health were, were in a good space here, there's still a lot of unknowns and questions in the bloom behavior. But this is where we got to target now is the nutrient runoff. Because this treating drinking water and worrying about how it impacts you or how the blooms behave is not an issue if you just remove nutrients in the first place. And so getting these nutrients down to where these are growths that occur in the lake but they're not at a bloom capacity is ideally where we need to be. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about what we know in this space right now going forward. Again, we've spent about $3 million. There's $3 million ongoing right now, and there's some more money that we have set aside, um, and we're trying to strategically think about where that money needs to go going forward. Very collaborative process, so I can tell you that when we talk about this research, whether it's in the human health impacts or the drinking water, it's not one university that can do this. You know, so you're seeing Defiance College for Dr. Kane. Here's Kent State for Beatty. Of course, Ohio State for Justin Chaffin. There are a bunch of people here, and we've got Rick from NOAA that's here, too. Is NOAA not making up a slide, Rick? Oh, I'll have to buy you a drink later. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but it's state agencies, it's federal components, it's the NGOs, the, the non-governmental organizations. Um, it's representatives from the farming community. So this has truly been a collaborative effort, um, in my opinion, going forward. Uh, we've reported out on a lot of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you're interested in this and what, what all these projects were, like the specific water treatment project or the specific human health project, they're all outlined in these series of, of reports, and they're all available. And if you're interested in it, I can give you a link to this uh, later. Good. So here's where we go with nutrient sources today. So I'm really going to get away from kind of like water treatment and the human health aspects and, and, and even some of the bloom behavior and talk about where are the nutrients coming from today. So if you look, the Maumee River and the Sandusky Rivers are the largest sources. So about 87% of the phosphorus um, we now know is coming through non point So basically, this is coming from a place that isn't entering the system through a pipe. So we know how much each wastewater treatment plant contributes. We know how much each industry that discharges contributes. We have a good idea on how much septic paint runoff comes into 
into these systems. So there are knowns. Everything that isn't coming from a pipe is basically for Lake Erie. It's about 87% of it is not. We know that in these two rivers, the Maumee and the Sandusky, that ag is the dominant use. Depends on which river you're in, but it's greater than 70% in both of these, these rivers. What I will tell you also is that storms are a key component of this. We've seen, and this is coming from Heidelberg and, and, and Laura Johnson's predecessor, between 2002 and 2013, we now know that 70 to 90 percent of the loading, so 70 to 90 percent of the phosphorus we measure going into the system, is coming during the 20 percent highest flow. So what it's telling you is that every year, somewhere around 10 storm events are putting the bulk of the nutrients into the system. This is the time for me to remind everybody here that, yes, there is something we need to do with how we, as an agricultural community, put nutrients on the field. Don't put more nutrients than the crops need. We also need to know once they're there, you still need a mechanism to get them from the field into the river. So when we talk about this hazard issue, it is a nutrient management issue, but it goes hand in hand with a water management issue. And this is why when we talk about this issue, and as we're making strides in some places to reduce these nutrients, this is happening in the context of global climate change, where we have predictions in this area that might be warmer temperatures and also more severe and frequent storm events. We have to worry about nutrients on our ag fields, but we always have to worry about uh, this water management issue. So this is just an illustration to show you this. I'm taking this from Laura Johnson's data, but it's a, it's a good graphic to show you. So this is uh, discharge. So this is the amount of river coming, or amount of water coming down the Maumee River at Waterville. These are different years. So basically, when you see a spike, that's a storm event. Okay. So in green here, we're 2011. So there's a storm event, storm event, storm event, another one. Uh, you know, our memories are short, but if you remember 2015, it was a very wet June. We always joke saying that it rained twice in June, once for 15 days and once for 10 days. And it was a horribly wet June, and you can see that spike from, you know, pretty much no rain to the whole month of June was just rain event after rain event. After rain. What I'm going to put in the next panel is that discharge is not water, it's phosphorus. And it's going to have the t same time scale on the bottom from March to August, but this will be instead of discharge, it'll be phosphorus. Okay? So here you go, rain event. Look at your phosphorus. Rain event, there's your phosphorus. Look at all these rain events. Look at all your phosphorus. You can tag every one of these rain events to a load. So when I make that statement, 70 to 90 percent of the phosphorus comes 10 to 20 percent of the time, what that's telling you is that's a lot of phosphorus, but how many days did that occur over? And that's a lot of phosphorus, but how many days did that occur over? So when we see these large storm events, we need to think about how we manage those storms. Other nutrient sources today, as soon as we came out of the gates with us, the researching community and said, yeah, we, we think it's non-point source. Whenever you suggest that a sector of the community is the, is the source of this, I don't want to say the blame, it's the source of this, usually there's a, this, this attitude of deny, deflect, and dodge. <laughs> right? It can't be that. That can't be the way. So we put a lot of early research into finding where the other sources are, so it's a process of elimination. So I'm going to tick through some of these right now. A lot of the fingers were pointed at wastewater treatment plants. Okay? So we actually went, the Ohio EPA went, I don't think we, the Royal we, the Ohio EPA went and did a nutrient mass balance site. And basically what they showed that there's been a 75% reduction in wastewater treatment plants discharge of phosphorus since the Clean Water Act. Okay? When the lake was considered dead in the late 60s, early 70s, we thought it was, we knew it was, phosphorus coming from our wastewater treatment plants um, because they weren't removing it very well. But also, what did we used to have um, that has now been banned from some product that was being dumped into the lake in the late 60s and early 70s. Not that you see, but if that time period for that was the same, but we pulled what out of our laundry detergent? Phosphorus. Phosphorus, yep. So during the Clean Water Act, we banned phosphorus and, and detergents. So between having better wastewater treatment plants and banning phosphorus from some of our soaps, we saw a 75% reduction. If you go now and add up all the wastewater treatment plants that dump water into Lake Erie, it's only about 9%, the western basin of Lake Erie, it's only about 9% of the total phosphorus. As far as CSOs, does anybody can tell me what a CSO is? Combined sewer overflow. In older cities, the, the, the water leaving your house will join up with the pipes that are in the streets and the parking lot. It will all go into one pipe, a combined sewer over, and then it goes into a, a wastewater treatment. Uh, the problem with this is during a normal day when there's no rain, those water treatment plants can handle that volume of water coming from our homes. But if you had a rain event on top of that and all that water joining up in that pipe, the wastewater treatment plant can't keep up with it. So eventually they end up discharging raw sewage into the receiving water pipes. So a lot of people said, well, that's where your nutrients are coming from. It's these large CSO bursts. 
what we've been able to show is that in one of the worst blooms on record, uh, I think this is the third, maybe the fourth largest bloom on record, even in that year, if you add up all the known CSO discharges, so the, the points where the rain came down too much and we had to release raw sewage, it's only 1% of the population. Okay? I'm not saying we don't fix CSOs, because if you live around the Cleveland area, if you have a beach closure, this is why. Okay? Because it's the viruses and bacteria associated with that raw sewage. It's not driving the nutrient blooms or the phosphorus for the blooms, but it is still a problem from a bacteria and virus and load and standpoint. So we should be doing things like long-term control plans, which are in place. By 2020, uh, the state has identified 40 of the 62 communities that have these CSOs, and they will be eliminated. That's a good step, but it's not reducing our phosphorus and reducing the problem. As far as septic systems, the Department of Health has been around looking at these septic systems, and some of them are just failing. And so they're either running off through the leach beds of these septic systems, or in some cases, they have special permits to discharge directly into receiving water bodies. But even if you add up all those septic systems that we estimate are failing, it's only about 4% of the phosphorus. And there are new regs in place that are forcing states to clamp down on these. A lot of people will blame lawns. My dad's responsible for this. If he doesn't have the right shade of green lawn in the spring, he failed. Um, so he's putting on fertilizer all the time. Scott's Fertilizer Company, which controls a large percent of the lawn fertilizer market in the state of Ohio, actually the Midwest, in 2013 banned phosphorus from its fertilizer. They've done studies, these lawn companies have done studies that if you want to grow a lawn, you don't have to have phosphorus. There's a natural background phosphorus in our soils that all you need to add is potassium and um, nitrogen. Um, that's different if you're going to put a seed down and try and grow a lawn from scratch. A little bit of phosphorus to get that established, but once the lawn is rooted and growing, you don't need phosphorus in the soil. So the likelihood that the our suburban uh, folks, like my father, are contributing a large component of phosphorus is not likely. And the last one we want to mention, and, and some of the researchers in the room played a role in this. In 2014, there was funding that came along line to go in and study Lake Erie. So internal loading is basically we have phosphorus at the bottom of the lake. How much of that every year is coming back up to the surface to drive? And so a handful of scientists went out and conducted, you know, 12 different styles or brands of research projects to answer this question. And the ranges came back somewhere from 3 to 7% of the phosphorus that drives these blooms is coming in turn. So if you do the math and you add up all these percentages, even with this variability at the end, it still leaves about 85 to 87% non-point. So the data that we've been saying is the case with the amount that's coming in from non-point has been backed up by the, by the research. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is understanding um, agri agricultural behavior. So what we've actually seen is, is the agricultural community is keep coming to us and saying, we've learned a lot about agriculture. We're not applying as much phosphorus as we did before. And so they're actually showing in the 70s to the 90s, they were applying phosphorus at 10 to 40 pounds more than the crops needed. Because back in the 70s, we were telling them, if you're making money off your crop and you can buy extra fertilizer, put it on your field because the soil will hold on to it. Kind of insurance uh, that you won't have to worry about it in the future. Because we thought if it sticks to the soil and you can keep your soil on your farm, it's not going to go on. Well, research, research is showing us now that the phosphorus leaks. The soils aren't holding on to it. And so we put excess fertilizer on our fields for many years because we didn't know any better. Okay? Now we know this, and so we've been reducing. So since the mid 90s, there's two studies, Mullins uh, in 2013 and the NRCS, uh, uh, USDA, did a study in 2016. So two different numbers, but they looked at the question a little different. The Mullins paper is showing that we're applying five pounds, on average, below crop removal rate. So the phosphorus addition is coming down. We're doing a new job in that space. The NRCS paper said, on average, it's five pounds above, um, but what they're showing is that 58% are applying well below um, the removal rate. What I will say, and the caveat, and it comes out of this paper right here, is what I've been saying a lot of the last couple months. A farm isn't a farm isn't a farm. What I mean by that is even though these are averages, the NRCS found that 42% of the acres in the western basin of Lake Erie's watershed are contributing 78% of the phosphorus. What it tells us is that some fields have the phosphorus right where they need to be or lower than they should be to grow crops, but other fields are really high. The problem is Good. So what I want to tell you now is, is I titled this slide directionally correct because I used this, this opportunity for not only the audience I have here but the lay audience to tell them the nature of science. 
Um, in my opinion, and I hope all the other scientists in the room agree, that if you hear any scientists say that we proved something because of their research, you have my permission to go and grab their ear and yank them the really hard. There is no proof in science. Right? We have a research question, we address that research question through experimentation, and we accept or reject our hypothesis. I remember back to my days as a little kid in school, and, and, and I remember teachers telling me you cannot prove all crows are black. Because when you wake up one morning and there's a white crow sitting on the fence post, you're in trouble. Right? So we eliminate possibilities. But what I hate when we talk about the nature of what science is, that there is no absolute proof, is that people will stop progress for proof. They're going to say, well, if you can't prove it, then why should I change? And so what I started doing now is when I give this presentation, I tell them, we are directionally correct. We have studied these questions enough. The answers keep coming back in the same space. And we're not going to say there's absolute proof. We are so confident about this that we are directionally correct. And you cannot stop doing what I'm going to suggest the ag community does here, does here just because you don't have absolute proof. So the first one is for our nutrient certification program. So in Ohio, the Senate Bill 150 came out and basically said there's a training program. If you are a farmer and you apply fertilizer on greater than 50 acres of land, you have to go through this program. And what it tells you is you've got to learn that there's a right fertilizer source. On some fields, you should apply commercial fertilizer, and on some fields, maybe you can do manure. The right time, don't apply it when the ground is frozen sits on the surface, and as soon as that ground thawed, that nutrient is going into the soil. Don't apply more than your crop needs. We know the right rate. We know if you're going to grow corn, how much phosphorus needs to be in the ground for that corn to, corn to grow properly. If you're going to grow soybeans, it's a different number. We know how much has to be in the field, and don't apply more than that. And then the right place. What we found out is if you put it on the surface of the field, as soon as you get a rain event, it's gone. So now when we say right uh, place, that is just beneath the soil surface. We're telling them to inject that, that fertilizer just beneath the soil surface. Okay? So that's what's been shown through the science. All four of these things will show a reduction in nutrient runoff. Uh, already in this idea of right time, there is another Senate bill that went through Ohio, and it says it is actually banned to apply on frozen ground. Um, uh, so that's fall or winter. Um, either fertilizer or also in Senate Bill 1 is this idea of no rain in the forecast and saturated soils. So again, that gets to the right timing. And so both of these are in place. If a farmer saw his neighbor doing either one of these, he could actually report that farmer and there would be consequences through the Department of Ag on the back end. Eliminate broadcast application. This is this idea of right place. So broadcast application is where you just drive your fertilizer tractor on the field and you spray that fertilizer on we are asking farmers now to do is what we call subsurface placement. Okay, um, what that means is you want to put it underneath the soil again. This idea of being in the right place. Um, we are not telling farmers to go back to tilling their fields because when you till your fields and mix up the soil too much, when you get a rain event, you get soil erosion. So we're telling them it's very different between tilling like we did, you know, 30 years ago versus banding or injecting those fertilizers. Soil testing, and this goes back to this idea of this uh, right amount. We need all of these farmers to be testing their fields. They need to know how much fertilizer is in there now and know what crop's coming next. So do I need it or don't I need it? You'd be surprised, but we're seeing that somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of farmers aren't soil. They're buying fertilizer and putting it on their fields without it. When I talk to, to farmers about this, they say because this costs money. Right? What we've shown from most farmers that I interact with 95% of farmers are interact with, they pay for this, but instantly their fertilizer bill the next year goes down, and their yield, what they sell, goes up. And those two things together outweigh the cost of the soil. So the fertilizer bill goes down because they were just blanketly throwing the fertilizer all over the field at the same rate. So there are some parts of those fields that wouldn't need it, so you don't have to buy the fertilizer at the field that's needed. And the yields go up because there's some parts of the fields where the fertilizer was too low. And even when they took that random guess and put just a blanket amount of fertilizer out there, there weren't pretty enough there to get the yield to turn up. So they're actually soil testing and applying the rates where you need it, you add a little bit more, where you don't need it, you don't buy the fertilizer. That increased yield and decreased fertilizer bill offset that cost. The last one, as I've already mentioned, is drainage water management. So the idea that, yes, we need to stop applying fertilizer on places where it doesn't already need it. Um, but even that, we have fields out there that already have excess phosphorus from some of our mistakes made in the past. And those can still be sources of nutrients.
nutrients into the leg. And the way to reduce that is by reduce the runoff that comes from those fields. So disconnect hydrologic pathways. So there are drain tiles right now throughout Ohio because it's should all be wetlands and we needed to drain them to grow crops. But you can now put wetlands back in place or things like blind inlet. What a blind inlet is, is it takes this drain tile and before dumping directly into the lake, river, or stream, it runs through a bed of things like coconut husks or charcoal. So the water or the, those sediments in those blind inlets grab those nutrients before the water comes back into the lake. A good portion of the phosphorus is leading through the tiles, so we need to think about this tile placement. And we've shown that cover crops actually hold water on the field longer. So if you get heavy rain and you got a cover crop there, it holds that moisture. Um, I'll skip through this because I want to just be able to get to some questions for you. Um, this is the last slide I always put in here because I would say, again, a large percentage of my time is walking around and talking to farmers, and instantly they feel like it's a blank game. Okay? As a scientist, I'm not blaming anybody. We have limited resources to solve this problem, so I want to direct those resources to where it needs to go. Why dump millions and millions and millions of dollars to fix wastewater treatment plants that are already really not a large contributor? Why spend billions of dollars to control CSO? If you're from the Cleveland area, you've seen a lot of construction in that area. They're building three huge underground tunnels to hold wastewater. So during those storm events, rather than having a CSO that blows into the lake here, they pump it into these underground tunnels. And then when the rain passes and the water treatment plants catch back up, they pump the water out of those tunnels back into the water treatment plants. Cleveland, in that effort that they've just done, has been estimated to cost about $3 billion. Well, if CSOs are only contributing 1% of the phosphorus, again, the virus is not your problem. But if it's a phosphorus issue, we could have perhaps used those billions of dollars to bring it up. So we need to think about what other things we can be doing besides adjusting just the ag issue. And so these are some of those things. Lawn care recommendations. You know your, your grass doesn't need phosphorus. So when you go into Lowe's or Menards or Home Depot or Ace Hardware, make sure you're grabbing a bag that has no phosphorus. Property runoff. Again, the more water we send to these wastewater treatment plants, the more chances that we have of, of having to have CSOs. So do things like rain barrels or terraces or forest surfaces. Get that water to sit on the landscape longer and soak in. Okay. Sewage treatment plants, we do need to get rid of those CSOs, but we got to balance that with the cost of what it does to do these um, agricultural practices. But you can do it at your own home. There's low flow shower heads, low flow toilets. I always make fun of my father here, too, because I told him he needed to get a low flow toilet, and he said, no, you know, mine works. If it ain't broke, I'm not fixing it. Why spend 150 bucks on a new toilet when this can work? So I told him to put a brick in the back of the toilet. That tank on the back of the toilet, every time you flush, that's the water that goes through the toilet. If you put a brick in there, the amount of water that fills up that tank is less. So you can create your own local toilet. And so you put a bunch of bricks in there, and then mom got pissed because she had bricks in her toilet. So she went and bought bags of marbles to replace the toilets with, like anybody's looking in our toilets when they come to visit. <laughs> That's the family I come from. But these are the things you can think about. You can be creative about controlling water without having to invest a lot of money in, in a new toilet that's cheaper to buy marbles. Even more cheap to buy bricks, but whatever. Um, and then we can monitor these septic tanks. So if you live in a community that you're not sending your water, your wastewater to a municipal uh, wastewater treatment plant, you've got to maintain these. So make sure they're working properly and you're not discharging into, into receiving water bodies. So I'll close here with uh, these last needs for me. We need to continue on this water treatment path. There is still some things we need to learn. So we've got to do the wastewater or the water treatment so we're not uh, drinking toxic water. We still need to look at the health risks. But for me, it's, it's this 40% reduction now. We've got to switch gears to start working on this nutrient reduction. And in my way, the two, the, in my opinion, the two ways we can do that is by following the four R's, so that directionally corrects slide. You know, the right amount of fertilizer, don't overapply. You know, make sure you're getting it under, under the ground without, uh, without um, tillage that you're injecting or banding. Um, and, and don't apply more than crops need. But then we still have this water management issue. Even if every farmer today was trying to only apply what the crops need, we have legacy pools of phosphorus sitting on that landscape. And if we don't slow the water moving off that landscape or find a way to draw down those high levels to where they need to be, we can see the genes in the And oh, I'll skip through that too. Well, that's where I have, you know, I've, I've ended a little bit early tonight, um, but I, I'd be happy to take some questions before we take a little break and bring Dr. Schnell up. Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, regarding the uh, the issue of uh, people injecting uh, phosphate into the ground, yeah. uh, if, uh, has anyone looked in, in areas, areas in agriculture or areas where perhaps people are not doing that? Has anyone investigated using uh, remote sensing techniques like spectral spectroscopy to scan to look for high areas of yeah, so there was a, there was some research that came early out of Bowling Green State University. There was a professor there that looked to see if they could use spectral imagery to look at nitrogen con or phosphorus concentrations in the soil. The the that technology is very good for water column because you can penetrate. It is not very good at determining uh, levels of nutrients in sediment. Okay. There is some crazy stuff. Being at OSU, I get to see some amazing stuff going on. There are uh, drones now that the university is using that is going out and actually taking leaf, leaf tissue samples. So they're taking a drone, flying, grabbing a leaf tissue, and trying to measure plant stress hormones. And that's what they're using to determine whether the plant needs more nitrogen or phosphorus or things like that. So there's a lot of technology that's on the cutting edge of some of these things, but, uh, but it's not through look, not using some of that technology right now to determine soil phosphorus levels. Thank you. Yeah, Doug. So where I've lived the last year, There, probably a week doesn't go by with someone saying, well, it's, it's agriculture's fault, but it's not row crop, row crop agriculture. It's the, the CAFOs. They're the ones that are producing 90% of this. Da, 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 da. So where do they stack up in all of this? So it's an unknown. So what, what a CAFO, if you don't, you're not familiar with that, that uh, stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. So in Ohio, depending on whether it's pigs, chickens, or cattle, there is a certain number of animals that classifies you as a large operation, which is a CAFO, a medium operation, and a small operation. Any one of those, if you are a large operation, whether it's pigs, cows, or chickens, you are regulated by the Department of Ag. So they come in and say, okay, how many animals do you have? Okay, you're producing this much poo. You need this much land to put that on. And they will tell you where to put it. You're not allowed to put it in excess in some places. So it's really never the CAFOs. There's actually a study that uh, Jay Martin at OSU and his graduate student did to see. They went through all the paperwork and all the reports and all the investigations that the uh, uh, Department of Ag did on these large CAFOs, and they're actually, most of them are compliant, okay? So here's the issue. Of all the acres in the western basin of Lake Erie that are in Ohio, 80% of it is row crop, meaning they're buying commercial fertilizer for it. 20% is manure out. Of that 20% manure application, only 20% are capable. Most of the manure producing institutions and or farms are medium or small farms, and there are no regs. And so we don't, number one, we don't know necessarily where all of those are, and if we did know where they are, we don't know where the soil is. So there is a percentage of this watershed that has animals on them that we don't know what their contribution is, so it is a place to, to go and investigate. There are, then you get in that space, space of it is private property, you know, what regulations do you put in to talk about those sorts of things. And that's not where science should be. We're in the science realm. We've eliminated the, you know, yes, point sources are a problem. Here's the non-point. Now we're in that non-point world, and we've got to keep drilling down and drilling down. But it's not my job as a scientist to suggest regulations. It's my job when a regulator calls me and asks me, what do you know about where the nutrients are coming from, I can tell them. But that's my lane, and that's where I stay. Divide your farm so you stay below a more restrictive threshold. So you have 999 animal units or something, then you have A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, is there any sense of what that might contribute? No, we don't know. So he's referring to, let's say, it's 700 animals that uh, cause 700 cows that cause you to be large and permitted. You have seen some instances. This is probably more the exception than the rule. So I don't want to start throwing out bad, you know, bad rumors right now. But there are some instances that say there is a family that the land has been in the family forever. Uncle Joe has this amount, he has 699, and right next door is Aunt Beatrice, and she has 699, and they're all in the same area. We need to identify those hotspots. We know that, so prior to the stage we're in now, where we have some of these larger factory ish farms, these capos, many farmers used to have 10, 15, 20 ounces, these small, what we call homesteads. So they might be farming 400 acres, and they got a barn with just 10 ounces. Well, so the problem is that a lot of times when it was time for Billy Bob and Sue to go out and clean the barn, they didn't take the manure from those 10 animals and take it all the way out to the corner of the 300 acres. You moved it 
outside the barn and put it in So that historic homestead might have 400 acres, and 99% of the field is right where the, as the soil test phosphorus needs to be, but that one spot is not. And if the topography of the landscape, especially if any rain event goes right through that odd spot, that's an issue. But then we're starting to get down, we're talking 4.2 million acres in Ohio that are in ag. Finding where those little homestead hotspots are or these 699 farms are not an easy task. Uh, my question was, you were talking about how the fertilizer should be injected below the soil. Does that require equipment or labor that farmers aren't used to doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the question is, if, if you're going to inject it, that requires a new toolbar that the farmer doesn't have. So there's a cost right there. The other one that we found from, from interacting with farmers is that when I have this sprayer on the back of my tractor and I'm just driving through the tractor and it's spraying, I have 30 miles an hour. If I'm pulling a toolbar that I've got to inject, I've cut that down by you know 30%. And so farmers right now in the state, given the climate we have with these severe storm events and these crazy spring rains, when I get out and feel, I need to get out and feel, and I need to get the heck out of there. So that time component is a tricky thing. And so that's why it's this beautiful park where we're in these what we call wicked problems, these big issues that we're dealing with in Lake Erie, is that, yeah, the science can say, toolbar, that's the way to go. You can show the data that if you inject it, you know, the runoff is less likely. But then if you go to the farmer that's got to implement it, there's some barriers. So we're doing a lot of work, Ohio State and other universities, to survey the farmer's behavior. And that's the slide I didn't get to. You know, I wanted to, so I can pop back based on your question. But this is things like soil tests. We didn't know, and I think this is like 15, 16, 17 are the years it was done. So in the study back in 15, they didn't ask the question. In 17, they asked how many were uh, doing soil tests in form rates. It was only 60% of the farmers. In that same survey, we said, well, if, if you, you did 18 and thought what you would do next year, how much would, would you do if, if you did before? And 30% that said no, they said they would. But here, like subsurface placement, in 15, only 25% of the farmers were doing it. In 16, this percent, and those that projected they would in the future is here. So these numbers are down, not because farmers are like, eh, I never fish on Lake Erie, I don't care anyway. It's because there are, like, serious constraints to being able to do that. So that's why as a scientific community, this is, it's 87% nutrients from ag. But that's not me standing here and saying, damn you. What it means is, okay, now we've got to plug the research in there. If it's incentives, if you can go to a community and say, how many farmers do you have in this community? Let's buy eight toolbars and it will be shared by all the farmers. Then let's try those problems. So that's where we're in. We're now in the behavior aspect of the farmer, the economics of the farming, policies, which policies need to be in place versus which ones don't make any sense. We're in that wicked problem place where it's not just the science. Now you're, you're wrapping all of these other social science components. Yeah, you had talked about bringing back some of the wetlands. Is there data to say that man-made wetlands will remove some of the stuff that they have seen in the ESD 10% as well? Yep. Yep. So wetlands that we, you know, across the board, for the most part, we'll, just, we'll show a drawdown. The problem is that where you want to put those, yep. some of them are just not conducive to it. So what a lot of the talk is going on is, is when you find that, the homestead example I used, yep. if you've got one, flow pattern that's going right through that hot spot, well, maybe just a little wetland that's tailing with that. Attic. You know, man-made wetlands are still far, far away from, you know, natural wetlands, but they do show drawdown capacity. Um, so it's a tool, but it's an expensive tool. And it's mainly, the one we're starting to see some success on is uh, what they're calling is uh, in-stream sediment basins. So they're going into some channels, and they're actually digging out huge depressions within these channels, because what it does is get you that flow pattern slows and some of those sediments drop out. We're doing a lot of what are called two-stage dishes, if you drive around the streets now, you just have these ditches that are to convey water off the landscape and get it the hell away. Now what they're trying to do is build that and then put flood banks or, you know, little hips on them. So what happens is when it floods, it comes out of that channel, goes up on that flood bank, and then drops out those sediments. So all of those are, are in play, but if I'm a farmer and I need to turn profit off my field, as soon as I put those hips on those two-stage ditches in there, I can't plant them. So you've got to find a farmer that's like, now, well, every other year that floods anyway and they lose the crop, so I'd rather get paid to not do that or blah, 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 and so then they'll, they'll adopt it. So a wetland's a good tool, and a lot of these, what we call BMPs or best management practices are, but there's no silver bullet. So you have to go to, you know, not every farmer, but many of the farmers and say, oh, your farm's like this, this will work for you. Oh, your farm's like this, and a different solution. Yeah, you make uh, Take another question. Yeah, where's another question? One of the great things with drain tiles is uh, you got to drain the lake to run spawn. I mean, Toledo was the great flex spawn. So it's wet, but you got to get the water up. What we're starting to see is instead of those drain tiles coming off the field and then dumping right in the river, we're now putting drain tile risers. They actually put the water comes into this like big 
the water just kind of running free flow, it'll actually fall into that weir and hold water on the landscape until it gets to a certain level, and then it'll dump out. So we're teaching farmers to go in there saying, well, you don't have crops in your field? Put those weirs all the way to the top and back up all that water on your field until you're getting ready to plant crops, and then pull it off and kind of dry out the soil. So we're giving them mechanisms to go in and pull these little different tile um, uh, weirs out of this box to control where the water table is found out also recently at University of Toledo, um, one of the big things against adopting those was farmers. It was just too much work to go out there now. Now there are, you can like call it up and tell it to automate it and tell it to, you know, drop down to a... So they can link it to their app so there's yeah. a water, so when the water table's up to a certain level in that water, then it'll tell you to go out there and, and drop a weir or add a weir. And that is, we, we tell these people, here's your solution, you put it in the field, and they're like, oh, good, I'm done, and then they go back and, and they don't touch it. And some of these things will take some maintenance and some upkeep. Yeah. So after um, you know, harvest and everything, you know, you're going to have So there are, but if you look at that picture, like, so we have, it's funny, I, I, I get engineering solutions emailed to me all the time. Like, I've had people come and say, because it's chemical. You drop it in, and it sucks all the phosphorus. And I'm like, number one, we don't want all the phosphorus gone. It, it helps drive this food web that's here. We want the excess. But then they also say, well, yeah, it's only, you know, two drops per, you know, 20 gallons. Like, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're going to fill one of those, like, flame retardant flame in the fire number forest fires and drop this red chemical on the lake. I'm sure the population around the lake would love that. So we keep looking for those kind of heavy scale engineering solutions and, and we need to just take a step back and say maybe some of these pile riser solutions or finding a better, better way to band or inject. There's going to be an engineering solution in here, but that quick easy fix is Now there are differences. We've seen like smaller reservoirs that have big blooms. They're building Roomba algae eaters, basically, right? So what they're trying to do is go out there and harvest that. There are some pharmaceutical folks that have come to our lab and are taking water samples and seeing if there are some strains of more algae than the cyanobacteria that they can use other purposes. But the sheer volume and mass that Rick has shown in some of these things, just harvesting it is not at all. I don't want to cut into Rick's time, so what I want to do is take maybe like a 10 minute break, come back at five after, um, and then I'll introduce Rick and he'll give you a talk. I'm here, you know, you guys will see me next week and everything. So if you have any questions, let me know. And I, I just got business cards. So if you have anything else you want to know, just uh, please let me know. So thank you. Up with uh, NOAA NOS um, for uh, the Coastal Ocean uh, Sciences. So, great. Okay. Have at it. Uh, first, let's see. There's a couple of things. So first off, I'm going to show a little bit of this morning, and then I'm going to go off to other stuff. So people who heard before, if you think you're going to hear the entire morning, I only, by the way, I only had about 13 slides this morning, so, um, but you're not going to get the whole, whole, that whole spiel. Um, Chris had said I should uh, give a, the path of, of why I'm, why I'm here. Um, well, when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a cartographer. Most people want to be a fireman or an astronaut. Um, and uh, I want to be a cartographer. I love maps. Okay, so interesting thing. I'm here because I took the most phenomenal science course in high school to stage me. It's called typing. <laughs> <laughs> My senior year, I had an open election. Go, this is, so I took a typing course, which has proved to be incredibly useful. I had friends who took computer science. I can say typing was far more valuable for computer science than their computer science course was. I took typing. How does that get me here? I lived outside of D.C. At that time, they had a summer program. You could get jobs, um, college students, um, jobs with the government. So I applied in, and I could type, which was really valuable at the time. Hard to believe now for you kids. <laughs> and so I landed with the uh, State Department Agency for International Development in their Office of Science and Technology because I was a science major, environmental sciences. And I could type, okay, that seems like a good person to put there, so they just put me there. Um, so they were working out how to use new technology for developing countries. One of the new technologies was the satellite called Landsat. And there was a guy there who was trying to work with us to figure out what you could do with it. So when I had time in between writing classified memos, which I actually did, I had a secure, I had a secret clearance, 
Um, very cool, the stuff that I, I'd write a memo and then I, I started reading the Washington Post because I looked to see if anything about it was actually in the paper. And I would find, I'm way off topic here, but <laughs> because I would find if I wrote one that was called Confidential, it would be on page eight or 10. Papers were much thicker back then, by the way. Um, if I wrote one that was secret, once in a while the topic they're about might even show up on page two. I never wrote anything that showed up on the front page, though. So those were the top secret. I didn't have that clearance. So anyway, there was this land set, and I got to work with a little bit of the data and actually looked at data in West Africa. They were trying to figure out could they identify fire scars. The answer was, and so I found if you did, I did some enhancements, and this was so bizarre because I used like blueprint. This was not computer. Um, but anyway, I got there. So went to grad school. I thought I wanted to study coastal processes and beaches. Went to grad school. Um, my advisor, they were, um, uh, this is University of Delaware. Um, we ended out, um, there was there, uh, a study about 30 years before they laid brick dust, out, brick dust out in the marsh. They wanted to go back 30 years later to see how much accumulation there was. So I went out with them to help us. And we spent all day in this marsh, this muskrat ridden tidal marsh, and we were in and out and everything else. And we spent all day looking for it. We finally narrowed it down to, guess where? Right under the muskrat house. Never found a brick dust, but I had a blast. I said, I don't want to do beach processes. I want to do this other stuff. So I got interested in marshes and ecology on that side. And then because of my cartography, the satellite, and they had something going on with a new study in Delaware Bay. I finished my master's on marshes. This project on that, and he said, do you want to work on that? Bring in satellites and see if we can help with water quality and sediment and algal blooms and that sort of stuff in Delaware Bay. And I go, great. But I didn't do what Chris did. I just kind of, I wanted to do coastal processes. I had to go to grad school, and then I'm in grad school, and then I'm here at the PhD. So we end up there. The last step to get here, though, is I finished up. I figured out a way to do algal bloom, went to work for NOAA, and gave a, went down to North Carolina and gave a presentation that we thought we could find severe blooms in coastal waters. And a guy there said, you know, they're having a problem over on the coast with some terrible algal bloom. So I contacted someone with the fisheries service in Beaufort. This was Florida red tide and showed up in North Carolina. Never showed up before or after. You talk to economic impact. When this came out, Florida red tide, perennial brevis, uh, you get into shellfish and it's toxic. Um, it won't kill people, but it'll make you so sick you wish you were dead. Um, and they had to shut down all the shellfish. Well, when they did that, everyone heard seafood. Nobody in North or South Carolina for six months bought seafood. Sixty million dollars. Their, their seafood, they just everything closed. They wouldn't buy fish, nothing, at all. So this was a huge problem. And we started. We set up a monitoring program for that. Well, the person I worked with, Pat Tester, down there, happened to know Gary Fonensteel, who was at Glaral. So a number of years later, he was trying to. He was wondering whether they could do anything about trying to forecast Lake Erie. And I've been working on harmful algal blooms down in Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. He contacted Pat, and Pat said, "Well, I know this guy who's really good with satellites. He, maybe he can help you." So I met Gary Fonensteel. He said, "Can you work on Lake Erie?" I go, "Sure. Sounds good." Um, so here I am, <laughs> because I could type. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what I'll talk about first off is for, for those who didn't hear the forecast this morning, um, there's only a few slides on this. For those who did, you're going to get a repeat. Um, you can certainly ask some questions later. And then I'm going to shift to a talk um, talking about cyanobacteria blooms, but not. It's what Lake Erie can do for the rest of the country, and it's doing for the rest of the country. So there's a, a whole bunch of people involved. When we do this forecast for Lake Erie, we do an ensemble of models. And so what you see here is their model, there's a model produced by um, University of Michigan working with NC State, another one by Lumna Tech, another one by Stanford University. And then we have a couple of models that we, we've done also. And if I arrow, OK. Uh, as far as Lake Erie, uh, as many of you know, as those who don't, we had a really bad bloom last year. It's tied for third with, 2000, with 2013 for the third worst bloom. Uh, depending on how well we estimated all of this 
how much biomass there was in the spectacular scum that happened to go from Toledo to Ontario. It was about 200 square miles of scum. We're not even talking about the rest of the bloom, just the scum alone. Um, and of course, in downtown Toledo. So really bad bloom um, last year. We do this forecast every year, and we successfully predicted forecast the, the bloom severity. We said it would be a seven, it was an eight, but our uncertainty between the ensemble models was greater than that. Um, the severity, by the way, is it's a combination, it's biomass and time. So we do estimate the total amount of biomass, but there's also a factor of, we look at the peak 30 days. So what is the total, uh, what's the average biomass on the worst 30 days? So there's a time component in that. So we're trying to build in, uh, this is not a translation directly to biomass as well. There's also a little bit of log scaling. People may be familiar with the earthquake scale, where a nine is, ten, or an eight is 10 times worse than a seven. We're not at that extreme, but it's slightly scaled. So in fact, I've been asked a few questions on that, and it's roughly, um, so there's a slight scaling in there. But anyway, we got that right. And this just puts the context, uh, you saw this one, uh, 2013 was all packed right up on the Ohio coast, very comfortably. And but, um, this and this is the quantity, this is, um, in this case, we're looking at uh, concentration, um, microcystis cells. So we have a relationship on that. I'll touch on the next talk a little bit on the science behind that. But you can see the 2011 was all at its peak, at its worst case, it was all over from Toledo to almost Pennsylvania and also on the Ontario coast. 2015 was just, that was the worst bloom, broke 2011, and you can see just what a mess it is. Um, didn't quite make Cleveland, though, and 2017 is different. They're all very different in each of these years, which is um, noteworthy. It changes a lot depending on which way the wind's going. South wind, put it up on Ontario. Um, this was both a south wind first and then a strong west wind. We had a south wind putting part of it in Ontario, some of it there, and then the whole west wind just blew the whole thing over in 2011. In this case, in 2013, it came out of the north. So the people in Canada were really happy in 2013 that it wasn't their blow. Um, but that's kind of the whole uh, circumstance. Interesting here, by the way, this is this black um, area here, that's the plume of the Detroit River. And so the Detroit River has very low um, phosphorus concentrations, and the bloom does not form there. A cyanobacteria can't, doesn't grow in low concentrations of phosphorus. So those who are doing studies on this, you have to put a lot of phosphorus in the water to get it to grow compared to diatom. So, but the circulation actually pulls it around there. So it comes up the Michigan coast and then typically comes around when you have a westerly wind on the other side. Um, we do a bunch of models. I'm sure you all are eager for me to go in detail through every line of this graph. I won't do that. Uh, the point here is to show, whoops, is to, uh, to show we have a right, there are a set of models. There, there are different types of models. We have a mechanistic model we use, there's statistical, there's a process model. They're all different. And a very important aspect with, with, if you're trying to do a forecast, if you have one model, okay, well, how do you know it's gonna, how do you know it's right or good? You have two models and they're different. You have a higher likelihood of bracketing what reality is. So if you add models that are different, fundamentally different, use different assumptions, different characteristics, you're most likely to practice forecast. So there's a real advantage. It's the people who are, who are experts in understanding forecast science. I'm not an expert in forecast science. I try to understand the forecast, but in forecast science, say, you should use an ensemble of a variety of models in order to best do them and understand them. So that's what we use here. And we use the phosphorus load. Um, TPV, that's total bioavailable phosphorus. Uh, the great of Lord Johnson are here. All of you, many of you heard that. Um, there's, uh, in the phosphorus, there's particulate phosphorus, which is found in sediments. There's dissolved phosphorus. And of the particulate phosphorus, some of it will not come off the sediment. It stays to it. So only about 25% of the, that phosphorus is available. It comes, it comes off. The other part is we actually measured up the water bill um, of the Maumee River. And so particulates settle. So not all of that sediment actually gets to Lake Erie. We lose about another third. So about a little under 10% of the particulate phosphorus actually gets to Lake Erie and is suitable for the bloom. Dissolved phosphorus, a 
course, it's dissolved. It all goes with the water, so and all of that's available. So 100% of this is all phosphorus plus the particulate. This is the kind of load we're looking at. Um, it'll be that's through July. The total load in the spring is what matters. March to the end of July, we're ending out with another about 40 metric tons, probably through the end of the month. And you can see we're we're well below 15. We're well below 17 as far as how much phosphorus. Um, and so with our ensemble of models, these little bits here are the different models. We ended up with a forecast of six, and with that scaling of the log, if you wanted a very crude estimate of biomass, it's about half of what 2017 would have had for biomass. But when you take into account the time and area, that's where you, it's not one half of 2017 to take up. But we expect it to be much smaller. 2016, which was a pretty mild blow on the whole, although by recent standards, it's a mild blow. If you go by the standards of 15 years ago, 2016 was a terrible blow, but we've been kind of used to, well, if we don't have scum everywhere, it's a good year. 2016 was a, we didn't have scum everywhere kind of year. Um, but we're gonna, we're just certainly gonna be worse than that. Now the difference is there's a fair, fairly large spread on the models, but we all agree on this in 2017. And that gets interesting because as they all have different assumption, some internal uh, loading, first mention. Phosphorus coming out of the lake bottom are treated differently by the different models. So we may be able to look at that. Um, the process model is filling in the temperature in a different way. So we're a little warmer this year, a little differently than some of the others. So we have an opportunity here to, to examine some differences between the model that may help us understand processes. So not only is it good to do an ensemble of them, to bracket your forecast, but by using an ensemble, you may learn something by which ones do better one year after another after another year. We've been doing an ensemble now for this is the third year of an ensemble, so we're slowly building up that record. So that's the forecast, which unfortunately means there's going to be scum in my theory. Um, and what I, the, the standard thing on this is pretty simple. Keep yourself and your dog out of the scum. If you have kids, keep them out of the scum too. Um, but uh, uh, that's the simplest one because they're always, there's a, these balloons always produce toxins, and it may not be a lot, but what, in the scum area, it gets concentrated 10 to 100 fold, and so you have significant um, issues. And if you're swimming, you're right in the middle of that. So that's the, that's the simple one. Um, this just shows the kind of comparisons of the different sort of blooms, the, the really high concentrations. There. By the way, um, Sandusky Bay always has a plankton fix bloom. Starts in May, goes till November every year. I heard for some visits to Sandusky Bay, and uh, it's it's going really nicely right now. Really nicely. No, the blooms don't go nicely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is just some things about the. I, some of this was um, in the morning. Um, a very important issue was dealing with the tourism and economic impact. And so with one of the components, we had a lot of media people here, and the very important this morning is dealing with the media side. So trying to capture that, it's not about, oh, we're gonna have a bloom, oh my God, all of Lake Erie is gonna be green, slime, scum, and we're all gonna die. That's not useful. And, uh, and or we shouldn't go to Lake Erie because there's gonna be green scum everywhere and we're all gonna die, right? That's not useful. So an important part is to recognize that there are times, 2013 was a bad bloom. Um, I don't know, the Lake Erie, the Perry Battle um, Bicentennial, this is a ship out on Lake Erie about the bloom at its peak. There's no green scum. People had a great time with it. There were no reports of scum at the time. And we, we were running a, a forecast and we were actually monitoring the satellite at the time, so it was all great. Um, they vary a lot. You can see the these two different years. This area, no no bloom in 2010, a bloom in uh, 2008. Varies a lot, quite a bit. Um, a new satellite. I'm going to talk about this a uh, little bit, but this is the uh, this is now going to be the key one we're using in the future, Sentinel-3, and uh, just uh, phenomenal for this purpose because uh, we can pick up the bands. But I'm not going to talk too much about that stuff. Um, we do uh, a bulletin, and any of you here who are interested in Lake Erie who don't subscribe should get it. 
Um, I don't have a link, but if you type NOAA Lake Erie Hab Bulletin, it will pop up and you can subscribe. There's no cost, you just put in an email address and that's it. And you're, you're on a website for it. And this was actually one from um, a week ago, and uh, there was a little bit of a bloom started up um, in this area. And yes, people did report little packages of, of, of junk. The fact that that started, a, this is early, the fact that it has started a little early doesn't matter. Um, and I don't know how many people have heard Lake Erie's gotten really warm. Okay. Um, this is this is the average temperature, and you can see there's a difference here. That's uh, four four degrees centigrade, uh, what about seven eight degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty spectacular. And uh, microcystis likes it hot. Um, so there's a concern about will that make a worse bloom? Well, I go back to it's phosphorus. If you run out of phosphorus can't grow a bloom. What the temperature means, the conditions are more favorable for a bloom, so one of the reasons we have an early bloom. And this just shows 2018 started very early. If we look at 2013, the first time we, uh, 20 degrees is when it really starts growing, 20 degrees, and 25 degrees is when it's most happy. You can see that when the temperature went above 20, and, and this year was way back at the end of May, well, 2013, which was the third worst bloom, it wasn't until the 19th. It's all about the phosphorus load. That's the key question. So, and I think that uh, that wraps this one up. So, you do the magic to get to the other one. Escape. Why don't you do it? I'll probably stick it. Okay. Make it work. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you now you now know between what Chris has said, well, you know all about the nutrients going into lakes and you now know all about the bloom. Well, I asked the question, can it help us with the rest of the country? And um, interesting thing here, um, by the way, with, with NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, you, I don't know if any of you have thought of this, but why are we working in the Great Lakes? It's a lake, it's not the ocean. Um, when NOAA was founded, there's politics, politics everywhere. And it's a whole lot easier to create this agency, which wasn't really created. It was kind of, it was actually agglomerated. There, there was a law made that allowed President Nixon to put things out of different agencies together into something that he could call NOAA. So the Weather Service and the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries. It was a whole lot easier to get that to happen if you had, let's say, oh, senators from about 30 states um, like enough to even make it so um, um, uh, filibuster proof, veto proof, all that sort of stuff. And so if you do the math and you include all the Great Lakes, uh, including the Great Lake Champlain, um, it is a Great Lake, so there's actually a sea grant program in Vermont. We call it a very good lake, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so NOAA has responsibility for oceans and Great Lakes. EPA, as freshwater, has responsibility for Great Lakes and other freshwater. So we're working on the Great Lakes with Lake Erie. But uh, probably a lot more interesting politics there. Um, if you want completely other reason, why would NOAA be in the Department of Interior? It would make sense, right? The U.S. Geological Survey, all those other great things. Well, apparently at the time, the Secretary of Interior, Walter Hickel, Nixon was really annoyed with us, and he essentially said, there's no way this blankety blank is going to get this new agency to build this empire. He wasn't annoyed enough with them to fire him, but he was annoyed with them. So he said, well, there's already something in the Department of Commerce will put them there. So NOAA's in the Department of Commerce. And we are the largest agency in the Department of Commerce, and so they have a businessman who shows up every when there's a new president and thinks he's in charge of this major business agency and finds out, over half of his employees are a bunch of scientists. <laughs> Sometimes that works to our advantage because they're not interested in, in what we do, so that works well. <laughs> um, so Lake Erie, a uh, view from 700 miles up. Um, this is a satellite taken, I think, the, about the same day that Justin took that image of Put-in Bay, and if you, well, the lights were on, but you can see a green blob there. Um, and there is a national problem with HAP. This is a little old, but, um, but this, this is, I picked this one because 
um, uh, Jennifer Graham at USGS said, all these states that are red had either poisonings from cyanotoxin, that might be people, more likely animals, dogs, cattle, um, but some people, um, or, and then just our health advisories, both, or just poisonings. And some, some states don't report or do anything, um, have no idea. A number of states have had these, and they actually ask veterinarians to report um, this. And a uh, number of dogs die in this country every year from swimming in this. It's a toxin. So people think, well, their dogs can stomach anything, but it's not bacteria. It's not the garbage they're eating in the street. It's a, to it's a liver toxin, and they'll die, uh, they'll die of liver damage. Whoops. Okay. Uh, this one, this is a sea otter, Monterey Bay. Interesting bit, uh, killed by um, cyanotoxin. Coming into the coast, taken up by oysters right there. They eat the oysters, they actually died of this. And so there's, there's now actually concern about this interaction of freshwater marine environment for different things. Okay, uh, Lake Erie is not the only place that has problems. Lake Okeechobee is a very good example of a place that's had severe problems. This is 2016, and this is beaches. We're talking, how many people have been to Florida? All right, you've gone to the beach, how many of you have gone to the beach? Beautiful white sand beach, nice waves, this is the east coast of Florida. Can you imagine your stuff on Lake Erie showing up on that beach? And that's what happened. Um, the, uh, yeah, so I'll get to Lake Okeechobee again in a minute. So I'm gonna do a little detour on how we, what we do with Lake Erie. Um, if we want to find cyanobacterial, that's cool. So everyone can stay awake. Uh, okay. So a big question is, how do we find cyanobacteria? We're using satellites. And why use satellites? Well, there's, I would say there's, there's several reasons. There's two major reasons for using satellites. Uh, one being that, um, okay, there's a bunch of students here going out to sample. Um, so tell me, how easy it is to get a water sample and analyze it? Yeah, how many would you get? What's a good day? Three, four <laughs> samples? Okay. Well, I've got about a million samples in Lake Erie here on one day. Pretty good. And I got that before I got my coffee in the morning. So that's one reason. There's a second reason. and. Um, what if you wanted a sample from yesterday? Anyone got a time machine handy? I do. It's right here. I can look at, um, well, I can't go back too far, but we, we can go back to 2003 with uh, one of the satellites. And so I can tell you what's going on. So there are a lot of lakes in this country. There are no monitoring programs. We can look at them with satellites. It's a huge, huge opportunity for this. So, but we need to tell everything apart, and that requires a different spectral band. There's also interesting things. People assume that we're just looking for the scum for satellite and Planckothrix. How many have seen Sandusky Bay? Everyone? Okay. Some are going to see it soon anyway. There is no scum in Sandusky Bay. Planckothrix doesn't make scum. That's a picture I took um, last year. I was over there the other day. It was a little more khaki colored, but it looks about the same. No scum. And it's lit up. There is a load of Planckothrix. It's chuckle, sometimes a lot of methanophone on all kinds of good stuff. No scum whatsoever. Well, with satellite, we, uh, we have a bunch of bands, uh, spectral bands. This is a spectral across the bottom. Um, I've tried to label this. These are nanometers, so blue, green, red. Everyone, I'm sure, is Roy G. Biv, but that's backwards. I don't know why. Well, I know why they do that. But anyway, so this is the blue bands, the green and red. Um, this is out of a cyanobacteria, and, and this is the reflectance. So this is from a radiometer that I pointed at the water, measured the reflectance of water that was full of cyanobacteria. Um, can anyone tell me where the peak reflectance is? Which color? Green. How about that? What color is it normally? Green. Good. This is the microcystis bloom, and it looks green, very green. The reason it looks green is you got all this, it's full of chlorophyll. There's maybe other stuff, and that absorbs all the blue light. It also has chlorophyll absorbs red light, and it's also got this interesting pigment, phycocyanin, diagnostic of, of, of microcystis and most of these freshwater. That absorbs orange-yellow light, so you have this very strong peak. 
interesting because of the chlorophyll and because it scatters so strongly. Microcystis has got gas vacuoles, and so you end out with a lot of scattering in the cells. So you end out with this dramatic difference here. The chlorophyll is absorbing all that light, but the cells are scattering. So you have this weird thing. Well, these, these are all the bands. So we can pick up phycocyanin, pick up the chlorophyll, and pick up the scattering. Um, and then this is all water absorption over here. So by looking at these dips, that's what we're interested in. I don't bother with the green. We're looking at, we're looking for these pigments. We can quantify how much chlorophyll there is in, in these blooms and how much, and whether there's phycocyanin. So that's what we go after. We actually literally measure this step. We, um, it's the curvature method, a second derivative. How many people took calculus? Oh, good. Well, you never knew it could even be useful after you left school. <laughs> uh, second derivatives are awesome because it, um, that curve, it doesn't matter whether it's high or low. So if we add sediment in, a big problem people ask is how are you seeing sediment? Well, sediment lifts the whole curve up. Sediment's bright. A little less sediment in the water gets brighter and brighter. The shiner, who's doing the shiner? Right, doesn't the water get brighter, kind of, when you put sediment in? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, absolutely. And so it goes up or down, but that, that, those dips, the second derivative, they just, they don't change. They stay the same. So we, we essentially eliminate the sediment. Eliminate a whole bunch of other stuff. I worry about the atmosphere, because we have to see through an atmosphere, and it gets rid of that, too. It's really great. So, and if you have um, scum, we have no trouble finding scum because, interestingly, it reflects more in the infrared than in the visible. So if we could see infrared light, we would need sunglasses for, for the near-infrared light that comes out of that. And sometime I need to tell you how near-infrared light was discovered. That's a really cool um, <laughs> thing, but I can't do that here. Um, First study on this was actually infrared photograph. Infrared photography was used for uh, plants. Oh, the, uh, your, your plants, by the way, the cornfield, if they, if they just took infrared photography, they could tell which corn is right. They wouldn't have to go out with a drone, and they could get the whole field. It would be cheaper. So you can let them know that. This, this, this is done for a long time. It's done with photography, but there's now uh, satellites that do like one meter resolution that can do this. Um, and so, remarkably, there was a lake out in California, perversely called Clear Lake, which is full of cyanobacteria. <laughs> and it has been for a while. I think this is a real estate decision, trying to sell land. That was my guess. Um, and because it's been that way for apparently quite a long time. And it is a natural lake. But yes, this is a descri description. That's probably the first known case of remote sensing of any algal bloom. It happened to be a cyanobacteria. It happened to be microcystis as well. And we can see scum. So here's our visible one where you see that green. Here's the infrared. All the land vegetation is lit up, and there's no question. Can you tell me where the scum is here? Can you tell me where the scum is here? Same image, same day. That's how powerful the infrared is. It's so bright. So if we want to know where scum is, this is how we actually map it. And on this particular one, which was in 2015, there was 300 square miles of scum. Just scum, separate from the rest of the pond. So really powerful. So we use, we use the, those second derivatives. We find the blooms. We quantify it. So you wouldn't think that there's a bloom here, but there is. There is cyanobacteria back over there, still in the west, eastern, western basin. And you can see the overall patterns really well across the whole lake. Oh, I borrowed this from an EPA colleague, and he likes slick animation. So, um, so we, I was working with EPA. So we did this in Lake Erie, and we came up with relationships to the cell count number of cells. And so the question is, well, does this work anywhere else? Well, this is data from not only Lake Erie, but Grand Lake St. Mary's, Buckeye Lake, a bunch of lakes in Florida, and a bunch of lakes in New England. This is the cell count with the relate. We took the relationship for Lake Erie. Um, the dotted line is a one-to-one -one line. It works everywhere. Want to know how much microcystis there is in the water? We can tell you anywhere in the eastern U.S because we did this for Lake Erie. So we now, we have that level of confidence that we can do that. So that's a huge part. Lake Erie's provided that resource. Chlorophyll as a biomass metric. Um, worked up the number, worked up a number out of uh, Florida, and that's proved to hold up for other places. So we can estimate the chlorophyll due to cyanobacteria only. Forget the diatoms. I don't, 
while they're trying to figure out what are their algae is. So when we actually report this, we're only looking for cyanobacteria because we're finding those specific pigments. Diatoms do not have phycocyanin. So that's one key indicator. So um, I thought I had a slide before that. I don't think I did. Okay. There is a, in here, in central Florida, a chain of lakes called the Harris Chain of Lakes. And it starts with Lake Apopka, which um, is a lot worse than Lake Western Lake Erie all year round. Um, not good. Um, we took the chlorophylls. You can't quite see this vertical bar, but it goes from 0 to 140. This runs 60 to 80 micrograms per liter continuously. And this is multiple years. Like, this is three years of data. Um, and it's the, it's the starting point. The water comes out of Lake Apopka and flows downstream. Why does it have a problem? Well, they started off in the, in the 40s or 50s with all this peat. Talk about draining swamps to grow stuff. Well, there, they don't drain swamps. They drain peatland. And they created what are called muck farms. I love this. You think they're farming muck. But no, they're actually growing vegetables. And of course, all the nitrogen, they just flush it right into the lake. It's because it's all around the border. So the entire border, which used to be um, swamps, is now nothing but farmland. All those wetlands are gone. An epitome, which Chris was talking about, of the importance of wetlands, all gone. So it became, it went from the premier bass lake in the eastern United States, bass fishing lake to a scum-covered mess. It's no longer scum-covered, but it's just not good. Uh, but it starts upstream, and that water flows through all the other lakes. Well, um, Florida EPA had started buying up the, those muck farms and restoring them to wetlands. And so the most dramatic one, Lake Dora, which was just downstream, you see it's up here at 80, and it actually dropped for a while. And that's because of that cleanup. This is 80 micrograms of chlorophyll continuously down to 40. Now, there's some other interesting wrinkles here. Why did it come up again? Well, fascinating study found with these lakes is um, the water level now. You have a fixed amount going in. People think of like here at Hughes, the water level changes the floods. It's a big deal. There, if you have dry season, it can drop several feet, and they're very shallow. So if it drops a few feet, you might have changed the water volume by 25, 30 percent. That means you change, you increase the concentration. So in 2011 was actually a dry period. The water level dropped, but the inflow stayed the same because it's not just a simple runoff issue. It happens to be, it doesn't matter. They'll suck the water out of the Florida aquifer to fertilize. So you ended up with higher concentration phosphorus, more bloom. Different process overall. But in general, another thing I'll note is, by the way, the satellite works. We got all the numbers. And you can see how hard it is to get the samples. Lake Monroe actually looks pretty good. That's down on less than 20 micrograms. So these, and these images, if it's red, it has a lot of cyanobacteria in it. And Lake Apopka is the worst of those overall. Um, Clear Lake, California mentioned. There's also Klamath Lake, which has got horrible problems. This is Klamath Lake. In fact, it's up, this is, we're talking 100, 100 plus micrograms per liter chlorophyll of just cyanobacteria. Um, and, and there's a set of reservoirs going down. And so what comes out of here goes downstream and then clogs up all of these reservoirs going all the way down, full of microcystin, full of toxin, all the way down the river, just because it starts up here on there. Um, yeah, nice picture. That's about what it looks like in most years. And these are actually the downstream reservoirs, and they get a bloom every summer, and it came out of the Klamath River, so the, I mean the Klamath Lake. So it just starts up there and goes downstream. Um, I'm going to skip that. OK. Um, Lake Okeechobee, um, 2016, we had the algal bloom there. Actually, I had another version of the talk. I added in some, but I'll just go through this. And so we weren't, um, the, the old sheet, the Sentinel was just launched. We didn't have it available. This is actually a modus scene, horribly blocky. This is actually later we generated um, an old sheet after the fact. We, we didn't have, from here, you can't figure out where Bloom is. Well, Lake Okeechobee, 
give the background here. Um, boy, if there's any place that is screwed up for water, it's oh, South Florida. Lake Okeechobee gets its water coming in from up north, the Kissimmee River, which actually goes all the way up to Orlando, and comes downstream. And then it actually, before we messed it up, it just is very shallow, and the water would just flow out the edge, the southern edge, right through the Everglades. So the Everglades was actually a river. It just happened to be a river that was 50 miles wide and about three inches deep. But the entire lake just flowed out. Well, that's no good because there's all this great peat. There's muck farm, and you can grow anything on peat, like sugar. Also vegetables, but sugar. And they wanted it down here because that's where the peat is. So that means you have to put in something to block the water. So they built a dam around Lake Okeechobee. And this is actually going back in the early 20s. There was a hurricane in 1926. Category 5 went right through. Miami wasn't very big. Hit Lake Okeechobee. This is 30 miles across, by the way. It's about the size of the Western Basin. Blew the whole lake, broke the levee, killed about 3,000 people. They all drowned. So they built a very high levee, the Hoover, the Hoover Dyke. So there's one inlet, um, and then a couple of tiny few dinky canals, and then two major outlets, one going west into the Clusatchee River, which is used most years, one going east into the St. Lucie River. OK. This site, the lake's shallow. Lake Okeechobee is higher than the surrounding land. There's a dry season in Florida, wet season. Wet season is also hurricane season. Not a good thing. So if you have a wet winter, um, El Nino, El Nino has produced wet winters in Florida. 2016 was in El Nino. They had a wet winter. That meant the lake was really high in May, June, where we're getting at the wet season. So the Army Corps of Engineers, who runs it, they're looking to say, if we don't lower it and a hurricane comes through or the wet season, it's going to flood and 10,000, not 2,000 people in 1920, 20,000 people are going to die. That's not good. So they needed to lower it. Well, the monitoring we had wasn't in present, and there was a massive algal bloom covered the whole lake. So they opened the gates on both sides, and all that water goes out with all that algae, all that cyanobacteria. And where does it end out? All over the, in the intercoastal waterway. It goes out in the Atlantic Ocean. It's a mess. And when it got into the um, inter intercoastal, the, the bays around St. Lucie, it just sat there. And interestingly, we don't hear much about smell on Lake Erie, but it, apparently it smelled something awful. And it smells like rotten chicken. Yeah. <laughs> that was the description. And everyone, people left. It was absolute disaster for a month. Um, just absolutely horrific problem. Um, and I need to get back and come back to Utah Lake in a minute. Let's get back. So that's what it actually was. Pretty cool colors, too, until you realize, my God, this is uh, fermenting cyanobacteria um, all over the St. Lucie. And oh, I did have these slides in here. I just didn't have them in the right order. So you can see the outlet here to the east um, and the one to the west. Now, they always always use the Caloosahatchee. They don't always use the St. Lucie. And the Caloosahatchee gets spectacularly disgusting um, as a result of that. Well, we've now got a capability here, and we've been providing data to the Army Corps of Engineers this year. Uh, it actually started last year. And so we're doing okay end at 9 o'clock, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. we're about done. So we, we process data every day for that area. Um, comes in. Um, satellites about every other day we get an image, but we process every day. And this is what it looked like on June 12th. The outlet, by the way, is right there and right over here. Eight days later, 42 percent, 78 percent, 90 percent. The core stopped the discharges. They were discharging water. They stopped the discharges. We actually had a significant management impact. They knew it wasn't a local bloom. This was big. They stopped. Right now, they're about ready to restart. Uh, unfortunately, it's been cloudy for the last week. That is one problem. We can't see through thick clouds. But they've avoided a disaster of this. 
90% of the lake, and this was, there was scum all over the place in there. So huge benefit to there. Um, interestingly, we're getting um, uh, Sea Grant's doing a favor, Florida Sea Grant, because we're just, we're just providing it to the Army Corps and the South Florida Water Management District. We've got all these news media asking, can you give us all the imagery? Because a couple of images showed up. It just said no on it. So they started asking, and so the Florida Sea Grant actually is, is posting the imagery for us um, there. You can go, you can actually go look at it as well. But we're, we're monitoring this um, continuously, and this actually gives you an idea of the scale, like where's the far crosses there. So this is an ongoing thing. Um, it's, um, and they have to lower the water level because if we have a Hurricane Irma again, a foot of rain, they're in, they're in trouble. So they're, they're, they're in a rock and a hard place, but what they're trying to do is manage this. The other scenarios when they open it up is to maybe run it for a day or two. It goes in a tidal estuary, stop it, try to get the tides to go back and forth, flush it, kill the cyanobacteria, turn it on again, go back and forth to try to get, try to get some kind of flushing action to get it to happen. Okay, so the other one is Utah Lake. Utah Lake, apparently never, it's in Utah, by the way. Um, uh, it's quite large. It's like the, um, yeah, oh, I did write this down. One of the largest freshwater lakes in the U.S., 36 in the whole, um, in the entire U.S. Sizable lake, very interesting, um, popular recreational lake. Um, it's not used for drinking water. It's, it's full of minerals. Curiously, it actually has a lot of mineral precipitation in it. Um, uh, interesting chemistry issue. But it's a very popular one. And then what the river comes out of Utah Lake goes into the Jordan River, and that's used for irrigation. And they, they don't want toxic cyanobacteria in irrigation water. The idea of spraying that all through the air onto the crops does not seem like a good idea. So they don't want that to happen. Um, so they had this bloom. They never had one before. They announced they closed the lake. They said it's dangerous because it was. There was a lot. There was a significant microcystin. I think they might have picked up saxitoxin, but I'm not sure. It's silicosperman, by the way, was the major not, not microcystin. Um, so um, 2017, the question was, okay, we've got. I've been working with USCCA, USGS to try to do this effort while well, we started in Lake Erie for the entire country, every large lake in the country, 2,000 lakes. And we're doing tests in certain areas. And so the question was, could we do something in Utah Lake? They're worried about would this show up again? We said, okay, my group actually started processing because the national wasn't set up. We started running Utah Lake. And we ended up seeing this and go, oh, it looks like they got a bloom here on Provo Bay and maybe in the south side. So we sent it to them and they go, um, no, we don't have a bloom. There's something else out there, but we'll check it out. Um, yeah, they had a bloom. Two and a half million cells of political pharma. So score one for satellite. Um, they were on top of this quick, quick response, and it just got worse, by the way. And um, But uh, they, they got, actually this worked out great. The state of Utah asked for the information. We got it to them. They used it promptly. They were able to manage that. Um, and there, the Jordan Lake comes out of the Jordan River comes out here. So they were looking very carefully at this area and noticed somehow the bloom didn't cover the outlet to Jordan River, remarkably, but very closely because the irrigation they would have announced people need to stop using it for irrigation water. So huge, huge effort there on this. Well, okay. Um, and by the way, if you do this with true color, try to find the bloom in there. Because this lake is so milky, you just can't see what's going on. And that's the power. When I talk about the second derivative, removing the sediment, yeah, it takes the sediment out so we can find the bloom. And brand new in 2016, this is, this is the imagery from June. Um, and they used that to track in. They started posting warnings already this year. This may now be a recurrent thing. I can't hide the exact reasons why we're trying to, they're trying to work out. But we have this power of doing this, um, being able to examine this question. So we have the information. And you think about that. If you go, if you go back to monitoring efforts, um, if you don't know where it is, you don't know where to monitor. 
you don't know where to sample. I can't find toxins with satellites. It can only show you bloom. We're trying to figure out, if, when Justin figures out how, how to model toxins, we'll pull that right in and, and include that as a model. But we can't see the toxins explicitly. But if we can tell people where the model or where to monitor, they're way ahead of the game. And if they know where a bloom is, they know where to respond. So that's, um, so start with uh, Lake Erie, and we can go across the whole country with this. So that's where it goes. Thank you. Um, about, about a half a mile. Um, Maris is, our old sheet is 300 meters. We definitely say we need 900 meters wide. Under certain conditions, we might be able to get down to six, 700 meters. Um, we're actually working through a process to make sure we don't include that. The issue is you get a pixel that's half land, half water. We can't say what's in the water if there's land in it. So if you have three pixels, the two on the edges may have some land in it, the one in the middle. But because of the way this stuff works, we're trying to actually push the, with the automated process, to get it down to just two pixels in certain cases. So bounce off that, for larger rivers, are you getting the point? Um, I mean, I, I'm self-taught, but are you getting the point the Maumee River up to, I think, the I-280 bridge. Okay. Uh, so that's so through downtown. We can definitely pick that up. Um, on rivers like the Ohio River you mentioned, uh, probably about 30%, 30% of the Ohio River over that whole stretch. Not the whole river, but 30% is wide enough. Um, there is another satellite, Sentinel-2, that doesn't have, it doesn't have the psychocyanin band, but it's got the it's got a band that at least allows us to find algal blooms in the presence of sediment. So we can't say it's cyanobacteria, but that's 20 meter resolution. Um, and there are now two of those, and we could get to every five days. So we might be able to say there's algal blooms present with that. We should be able to do that. Um, there's a whole fascinating question. The hard part with Sentinel-2, though, it's the logistics of how do we generate a product that anyone can work with? Because when you're at 20 meters, it's a mind boggling. We can't just generate an image for the state of Ohio because no one would, you wouldn't be able to deal with it. So we have to figure out that part. But there's, that's another component, at least to say, is there algae in there, a significant amount. But um, the upper mommy, it's not quite wide enough. You can simulate the satellite, and you can do this with um, a hyperspectral sensor that simulates the satellite, and it will work. It'll work fine. And we had we yes, we, with the algorithm that's been applied with the NASA NASA Glenn, and also a drone from uh, Flareon. There's a question in the back, I think, and then we'll get one here. And the that's the sensor on Sentinel three. Sorry, OLCI. Is uh, uh, Sentinel 3A is what we're using now. That's up. That went up in 2016. Uh, Sentinel 3B was just launched in April, and so that will become available in next year. It's probably in October. The data set will be available because they have to get it checked out and obviously get it in its flight orbit. Right now, very cool. The intercal they're exactly the same. Same sensor, the Ulchi Oceanland Color Imager. By the way, it's, it's pronounced Ulchi because it's. Uh, Put on in Italy. Anyone who knows the Italian continent, so it's old you. If it was, it, um, so anyway. But they're flying them in formation, so the two satellites right now are 30 seconds apart in space. So that way they can intercalibrate. The European Space Institute is intercalibrating the satellites 
And then once they finish that inner calibration, they're going to set it in this orbit, which will be exactly halfway out of phase with Sentinel 3A. So we're looking next year, we're going to have the two satellites. This, this is going to be phenomenal. And it's question about spatial resolution. Are, are there satellites up there that can get to one meter or less? That's true, and it's just blue, green, and red. That's all it is. Pretty much. Yeah. Worldview, um, Worldview can do a little better. We could get to something else, but Worldview um, is not routine. You have to order it up. And so if you're interested in one place, you could buy Worldview. Well, as a NOAA, I don't have to pay for Worldview data. It, it could find bloom. It can tell you, it can tell you the cyanobacteria, it can tell you there's bloom. Worldview is about two or three meter. And, uh, but the problem is you have to order it. So if we, if we want to look at the Maumee River, for example, we could order Maumee River. But if three months from now we want to look at the Maumee River, from three months ago, we're out of luck. Because we're at Sentinel, um, the Sentinel satellite collects the data routinely. So like the three, it's always on. Sentinel two goes over every 10 days and once with the two of them out of orbit. So it's always collected. That's the payoff. Is it's always it's always collected. It's not a you have to request the order. So that's that's the value. So they for for land these other satellites are phenomenal. Like for the crop things, Worldview could be great for crop. There's actually some very cool satellites in that. The um, the the dust that Planet.com has, they put together a bunch of smartphone parts, launch 50 or 60 at a time, literally these little CubeSats, and for crops, phenomenal. Red, green, blue, infrared, um, and they're actually looking at that um, as an idea to capture. The idea there is to capture whole Earth, but it's only red, green, blue, infrared, and in which case we're not going to have a whole lot of luck. One word per minute. Can you type? <laughs> 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 Everybody, thank you. Uh, All right, so that uh, week from today will be the uh, RU.